A new level of ambition and excellence thrives at the Texas Tech System. A $2 billion higher education enterprise with four diverse and distinguished universities. Because from here, it's possible. We are the family and the community that makes Walmart, Walmart. Whether it's stepping up in times of need, or standing with our customers in times of calm and celebration, delivering on our promise to help them save money and live better every day. We are Walmart. All right. All right. So excited to be here. And I have to say, I want to congratulate every single person in this audience for having the good sense to come here, these interesting people, and never mind that celebrity lawyer who shall not be named. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you to the audience, first of all. Uh, you know, and thank you, by the way, to whoever designed our panel title, right? I really, I like that, you know, finding Mr. Right. Uh, that being said, it gives us basically leave to talk about just about anything, uh, and we're excited to bring you all in to the conversation as well. I'm Susan Glasser from The New Yorker, uh, and I have to say I've been looking forward to this panel all week because I figure these folks are going to tell me uh, lots of things I didn't know. Uh, so help me with the questioning, and let's make sure they tell us lots of stuff we don't already know. Because uh, that, in the end, what's the point of talking about stuff we already know? Uh, so with that said, uh, I will just quickly introduce uh, our group, and then we can jump right into it. Uh, Bill Crystal, most of you I'm sure know him, the founder and editor at large. Is that the right title these days? Correct. The Weekly Standard. Uh, as you know, he's um, probably President Trump's number one fan. Uh, <laughs> so. Mutual admiration society, I think. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, you can get a lot of insight, I think, into what's going on in Washington these days. Uh, another super fan here, uh, no, but uh, a man, Ben Dominic, who is the publisher of The Federalist, uh, has a great radio program as well. Thank you. Are you still doing that, like, yes. every day? Yes. Right? Yeah. Uh, Subscribe to The Federalist Radio app. You know, he's, he's, he's got good stuff on there. Uh, and I say this as a, a veteran and possibly future guest. So. <laughs> We'll see how the panel goes. <laughs> <laughs> you might not you, want me. You get the answers from him next time. Okay, well, so you can see who gets the tough questions in this. Uh, Amanda Carpenter, uh, author, my fellow CNN contributor. Uh, we can shamelessly flack for her book at certain points, and I'm told it's, it's available here. It is. Well. I'll do a book signing at the Trib Fest Hub right after this. Okay, awesome. You know, it's about gaslighting. I didn't necessarily knew, know what that was uh, before the last year, but I think... Whether you know the term or not, you're definitely familiar with the phenomenon at this point. So, and last but certainly not least, Matt Lewis, who is a senior columnist for the Daily Beast uh, and also a CNN columnist. That's right. Uh, so, you know, forget about watching TV. You don't have to do that anymore. Um, so, I'm guessing a fair amount of you spent a significant portion of yesterday watching TV. At least I did. I spent all day yesterday watching TV. I'm pretty exhausted by the whole thing. Uh, so I've already said what I think about it. Bill, can you, first of all, give us your best assessment of the state of play on this Kavanaugh nomination? And then I want to just ask you to get us going by reflecting on, like, what was the Republican Party that we saw reflected yesterday afternoon in the Senate Judiciary Committee? Is that actually today's Republican Party? Or, you know, how do we think about that event that we all witnessed yesterday. I spent most of yesterday flying down here from New York, actually, and of course Delta had excellent Wi-Fi connection, <laughs> but I pretended to myself that it didn't work, so I <laughs> read a mystery novel and thought this is like the old days, which weren't that long ago, right? Ten years ago when you could actually get three or four hours away from the news. And then I was on a panel, Matt and I did Matt's podcast yesterday afternoon, so I actually watched very little of the hearings. Obviously, I've seen snippets and, and read about it. I, I think, in a way, people this always happens, there's something dramatic like this, and everyone becomes sort of a theater critic, which is understandable. Is it emotional, not emotional, is that effective, is it too hot? But at the end of the day, I mean, the facts are the facts, so it's hard to know the facts in some cases. And I do think at the end of the day, we weren't very far away from where we were at the beginning, probably, in the sense of having genuine, at least in my case, uncertainty about what happened 
35 years ago, not much clarity about these other charges, uh, and a sense that we will probably not know for sure, but there's more to be known than the Senate committee has tried to get known at this point. I mean, the FBI was not, I've been in the White House, I've, you know, I know what the FBI does and doesn't do in these kinds of background checks. It's not a magic thing. They can't, you know, suddenly, uh, uh, it, it's an investigation, they get statements, but there are things that would be nice to know, people who would be nice to be, to see interrogated and cross-examined that haven't, either privately or publicly, who haven't been. So I think that was the state of play at the end of the day today. Uh, yesterday, it looked this morning as if everyone was lining up for a partisan vote. I guess Jeff Flake has thrown a bit of a wrench into that in the last half hour or 45 minutes by saying that he, while voting to move uh, Judge Kavanaugh out of committee, wants to uh, pause for a week to see and to ask the president, presumably would have to ask for a renewed FBI look at some of these charges, so maybe they'll have more clarity a week from now, which I think is, yeah. I mean, I urge this, I think, I believe I Bill, on the podcast yesterday, you called for exactly what Jeff Flake is and, and blame Bill. Or and I think, I mean, it's quite possible we'll all be in the same place a week from now, but on the other hand, what's the urgency? We can have the vote a week from now, and uh, in that respect, uh, you know, I think it's, I, I think it would be the right thing to do. In terms of what we saw, I mean, it's, I mean, I guess if I wanted to defend the Republican Party, I, which I do occasionally, not as much as I used to do, um, I would say that, you know, this brings out the worst in everyone, honestly, a bitter partisan fight in which people genuinely feel their person has been mistreated. And a lot of these people know, uh, Republican senators know Kavanaugh. I mean, I have very close friends whom I highly respect, who served in the Bush White House, have the highest opinion of Brett Kavanaugh. I don't really know him, so I mean, I, I, this is entirely secondhand. But these are people I would, whose judgment I credit, who are not just party, you know, players and partisans. And they say that just out of the question, it's really unfair. And of course, they had two or three months to have these, uh, look into this, uh, whoever one wants to blame for the delay, it got delayed to the last minute and so forth. And then I, have, I watch myself, or I read uh, the assertions, and I think, well, those are credible too. And there are questions about some of what Kavanaugh has said. And so I'm agnostic. I think an awful lot of people are uncertain. Um, I, if, I was to say, if I wanted to be hopeful, I would say that what we've seen in the last week or two or three is partisans on both sides at their worst. If I wanted to be maybe a little more realistic, I would say that we seem to see partisanship at its worst more often today We've always seen it, some. I was in the White House for the Hill-Thomas hearings and stuff, but we, we seem to see it more often today and more immediately today and without with fewer guardrails or checks today than has been the case for quite a while, I think. You know, Ben, I was struck uh, over the last 10 days, or I can't even remember how many days it's been since, uh, since these allegations about Judge Kavanaugh first surfaced, but I was struck by something that surprised me a little bit, which was the, the idea that uh, even many people who are queasy about President Trump, uh, you know, even many never Trump or Republicans, uh, because he, Kavanaugh comes out of the Bush administration, because he is personally known to many of these people, uh, because he shares an agenda, a, a policy and an ideological agenda, that there was a lot more what seemed to me like, you know, re-coalescing of Republicans, at least a certain kind of Washington Republicans, than we've seen in the last few months of this very controversial period that, that's really focused on President Trump's kind of unique character and, and, and flaws. And so I'm wondering, is that just a, a very uh, specific to a Supreme Court fight, kind of like rallying back around, or do you see the possibility of the fissures that, that Trump the man has wrought uh, being papered over once, uh, once he goes away? Well, first off, um, I have to say, while I appreciate being invited here by the Texas Tribune folks, the makeup of this panel is just not good when it comes to charting the future of the right. Mm -hmm. No one on this stage voted for Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. The fact that we don't have someone here who represents the opinion of the millions of Americans who went out and voted for Donald Trump is ludicrous. We need to have that be part of this conversation before we dictate where anything's going and pretending that it doesn't exist which is typically what you see in the makeup on cable news, is ludicrous. It's just stupid, and I don't know why it still happens. The, the fact of the matter is that I think what we saw yesterday was the radicalization of a lot of Republicans, not conservatives necessarily even, as it related to this court fight. Kavanaugh had been this golden boy who was going through this safe choice, not someone who was gonna rile anybody. Now I think that he has achieved something that 
people were fearing about when it came to the potential choice of Amy Coney Barrett, which is we have a radicalized culture war that is here now, it's here tomorrow, it's here forever as far as the eye can see, and it's not going away. I mean, when you look at the polling data before yesterday, 5% of Republicans said that they believe Dr. Ford's allegations. Mm -hmm. And I would suggest that that money probably is, that, that number is probably down to a rounding error, you know, after yesterday. And I think that the fact is that when you see, I worked for John Cornyn for almost three years. And when John Cornyn gets angry, he doesn't swear. He'll say BS. He won't like, you know, uh, uh, actually like say the, the word. But yesterday I saw him and Lindsey Graham speak back to back and it's the most angry I've ever seen them in my yeah. life. And I think that they represent, and again, it's not ideological, that is just a partisan frame yeah. of they believe that Republicans and Republicans are uh, not just specifically in, in the sort of grand scheme of the Republican agenda or something like that, but that they are under attack and the people who saw that display yesterday believe that they're under attack too. And it's not just Republican men who are worried about being accused. It's Republican women who have sons. The number of women who were responding, my staff is majority female and majority millennial, and the number of them who were freaking out yesterday saying, I, I just cannot believe this. I cannot believe what I'm see seeing. And the number of them who said, I didn't vote for Trump last time, but I will this time because of this, is reaching almost a total percent. So I realize, I realize that that's not a frame that will be very pleasant to hear, here in Austin, um, but it's the truth. I think that we really do see a radicalization process happening, and it's going to be, you think this is bad, it's gonna get worse. I just know, gonna, let me follow on that. I didn't vote for Trump because of the smut and complete lack of civility that he displayed. And what we saw yesterday in that hearing was the Trump Trumpification of the Repo Republican Party in a Supreme Court hearing. Um, there was Brett Kavanaugh, tore up the rule book and just went for it. And I understand if he was falsely accused, I completely understand that righteous anger and he has a complete right to defend himself. But make no mistake about what has been unleashed because this is far bigger than one Supreme Court nomination. Lindsey Graham was once considered the nice, respectable, moderate guy in the Republican Party. <laughs> what, did he look like that yesterday? Absolutely not. And it's because people feel like they're under attack. And I am fearful of what is coming in 2020, because the consequence of Donald Trump's election hasn't been for Democrats to offer someone that could even possibly be acceptable to Republicans. It's to double down on anger, to send hundreds of protesters to the Capitol, to get hauled out by the Capitol Police day after day after day, and a guy like Michael Avenetti next door who's bringing nothing but more smut and lack of civility to the process. Right. So that's, that's future I just, 2020 nominee. All right. yeah. and and so I just, you know, I beg everybody not to say, well, good people who didn't vote for Trump, they don't represent Republican voters because I desperately want to come back to the party. I desperately want to support someone who I can trust and will restore some respect to this process. Okay, so I want to pick up on both of your points. First of all, I, obviously I didn't, uh, book the panel, so I don't know. My oh, guess no. is that they asked, my guess is that they asked uh, a lot of kinds of Republicans and were told no uh, by many people. And I've seen that phenomenon uh, over and over again, but I think your point is, is a very well taken one, Ben. And, and I have a and quick again. point. I don't know why it's called Making Mr. Right, because I fully intend on writing Nikki Ms. Haley <laughs> to be my Republican nominee in 2020. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, let me ask about the, the gender politics of this. Uh, you know, you're right that the default setting is, is Mr. In, in part because you do see an increasing gender gap uh, in terms of party identification. Right now, a lot of people are looking at the Kavanaugh situation and they're wondering, well, uh, you know, what is that going to do? Is, is this going to be a replay of Anita Hill and Clarence Thomas where the guy gets on the court, uh, but the women show up at the ballot box in response to it. Now, this is a, an election that's much closer in time. People forget, but the Thomas hearings took place in 1991, more than a year before the 1992 elections. Uh, but, you know, I want to bring in Matt on this, but uh, Amanda, quickly, if you have a thought around uh, Ben's very provocative point that actually for Republican women, uh, perhaps they encountered this uh, uh, experience yesterday in a different way. 
Yeah, I do. And I, I think, you know, I've got a son, I'm married, you know, to a man. Um, and the troubling thing about this is that you could look at both people and say they're credible and not know what exactly took place or why. And so everyone is in this box. And, you know, to, we're going to be studying Brett Kavanaugh's testimony for years and years to come because it not only tore up the playbook of, you know, traditional respect for the institution and blah, 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 senators, it threw gender dynamics completely out the window. Um, and to me, that was really interesting to watch a man become emotional um, in a way that we've never seen before. And I get it, you know? Well, arguably, Trump is pretty good at showing uh, uh, his emotions. Mm -hmm. And which is why people say he fights. Yeah. That's the whole thing. This is Donald Trump's nominee. You know, looking at Brett Kavanaugh's resume, it was pretty clear he wouldn't be the right nominee for this time. Forget about all the sexual accusation stuff. He's a swamp creature. There was all kinds of other things, but this is the guy that Donald Trump picked because I think he knew he was a partisan who would fight, and we saw that yesterday. Mm -hmm. So uh, is the Republican Party the party of men, Matt? Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's a simple, yeah, no, it, it is. And the, and the funny thing is there's always been there's long been a gender, you know, since Reagan, and probably even then, there's, there's long been a gender gap. Um, but we were, even before Donald Trump, and I don't think, I, you know, this has become a cliche now, but, but I don't think Donald Trump caused the problem we are. I think he's a manifestation of the problem. I think he's a symptom of the problem. I think that he's part of a, a trend, and he's sort of capitalized on the moment. Um, but part, part of the trend has been uh, this sorting and the the demographic, uh, you know, sorting, you know, uh, and 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 essentially now the Republican Party, there was already the gap, but with Donald Trump, it wasn't just that the Republican Party was the party of of whites or of men. It's basically we're getting to the point where it's going to be non-college educated white men who live in rural areas who are essentially what's left. And the really unfortunate and I think sad part of this is that Kavanaugh, the fight over Kavanaugh right now, and I mean, it's, it's worth the fighting for. We are talking about a lifetime appointment to the Supreme Court. If you're a conservative and you go back to Robert Bork and you go back to Clarence Thomas and you care about the right to life, this is a precious thing. And it could have been Amy Coney Barrett who was nominated. That's who I wanted. I think probably most of the people here wanted. She would have had other challenges maybe too, but not these challenges. The problem with the Kavanaugh narrative is it reinforces this exact same stereotype. Um, I do believe, I think you know, the stories we've heard here are true. I think there are probably, in fact, I know some of them. I know um, conservative-leaning women and center-right people who, who hate Donald Trump, who think Ted Cruz is scummy, but are now rallying to them. Mm -hmm. Just like Ben mm -hmm. said, that's a real thing. I got attacked yeah. on Twitter yeah. for saying it the other day. That is a real phenomenon, but that's Republicans coming back home. Mm -hmm. that, that has nothing to do with this other problem out there, which are women who are not center-right leaning, who are mm -hmm. coming of age, and they are seeing a Republican party that you know, when I was growing up, Reagan was our model. That was, that was the, you know, our icon. Now it's Donald Trump who talks about Access Hollywood things. Um, and now it's Brett, sadly, it's the Brett Kavanaugh thing. It just reinforces the worst stereotypes and I think is going to lead to even a bigger gender gap down the road. Can I just add, I mean, just two quick points. I, I think these are hard to predict politically. It's, uh, as we've seen, things can change in a week or two, let alone six weeks, let alone 2020 or something. So I think some of what Ben describes is going on, some of the opposite is going on among people I know and among men. And I mean, so it's cross-cutting currents, and we'll see where it plays out politically. It's hard to predict. I mean, I worry about the institution. I do think, and the reason I guess if I were there today, I would vote no on Kavanaugh, though I would vote yes on, a, I, I, on every, any other conservative appointee. I supported them all from Scalia and Bork through Thomas to Gorsuch is that I think the institution of the court now is damaged in a way that it really hasn't been in the sense that, I mean, Thomas had a very emotional defense of himself. He didn't attack Democrats. He didn't attack, he didn't mention yeah. the incumbent, the Senate majority leader. I mean, I guess, of course, Trump, of course uh, Kavanaugh mentioned Trump and so forth. He attacked an attack on himself, effectively. 
He had 11 Democrats vote for him in the vote, 52-48, lost two Republicans. It was an overwhelmingly Democratic Senate. Um, and that happened. And everyone said after Bork and Thomas, and I was one of those who, oh my God, we'll never have civil Supreme Court nominations and confirmations again. The truth is the next seven, if I got the math right, were not so terrible. They became more partisan. Gorsuch only, you know, only got three Democrats. But that was not still like this. Right, it wasn't and the one that went down was Harriet Myers, and I, I don't remember where you guys were on this. I was against mm -hmm. Myers for, because I thought we could get a much more distinguished uh, constitutionalist, conservative jurist, and we did. So, but what worries me about this is with Kavanaugh on, this is where I think people have to be sort of serious, with Kavanaugh on the court, it's really different from, we've had people who are quietly partisan, obviously, people who've gone over the edge a little couple of times and expressing their views. We've never quite had this, and with five, four decisions coming on a host of issues, I think as a matter of sort of institutional legitimacy, which is something I think a lot of us have thought more about and cared more about in the last couple of years anyway, this has done damage. If you had asked me what part of the three branches of government were in pretty good shape in the sense that it had pretty good respect across the board, of course it switches if there's a Republican president or a Republican senator or a Democratic president, but basically the courts are pretty respectable. You know, pretty people, that's what polls show and that's what I personally feel. And I do worry, therefore, about the jamming through Kavanaugh on a purely partisan vote in a way that I, I think there'll be some damage done. We'll recover, we always do, I guess, but. I think John Roberts is gonna over, maybe overcorrect this. Well, that could be. To the, save the institution. The damage is already done. Well, that's yeah. true. This is already over. Degree. I mean, this is not, I mean, I lived through the Miguel Estrada fight, okay? A, a fight that ultimately led to, you know, the eventually the death of his wife. The, I mean, the kind of fight that was going on internally there was the most gross, cynical, and partisan thing that I had ever been up close to when I was working for John Cornyn. And this is just that migrating up to the highest right, level of the court. between those things, and I couldn't agree more about the incredible injustice done to Estrada, whom I, you know, which I followed pretty closely, but between those things, Kavanaugh was confirmed in 06, and Gorsuch was confirmed a year ago, and there was a certain amount of demagoguery, but it was nothing like this. I, it's, you know, you it's know, total I, war. That's what it is. I don't, like, I, don't like affirm, I don't like affirmative action. I'm a white dude, uh, and, and I like a meritocracy, but Donald Trump, I think, should have picked a woman this time. Like, I, I really do. Partly because if you were going to overturn, no, if you're going to, if you were going to potentially overturn Roe versus Wade, it might be nice if one of the people voting on that were a female. He, how many, again, as a, as a white dude, and I'm a, I'm a fan, I like us, I'm okay with us, you know, <laughs> Donald Trump, I think, you know, again, we wouldn't be having this, we I might like, be having I a like different- I like Matt's image something. here of himself as a white dude, you know, not just yeah. a well, white I mean, male. Well, if you, if, you <laughs> liked, if you liked seeing white dudes on, uh, being nominated by Republicans to be on the court, um, you aren't gonna have that problem anymore. Yeah. Well, thanks it's, to Donald it's, Trump, maybe. Uh, going, going, going forward, you are not going to see another white male candidate nominated. You know, I, well, well, we'll see about that. I would, I would maybe take that bet, um, but, you know- That's a good point, though. I, I, I'm, uh, we can talk after. Okay, all right. He's a okay. fan of white dudes out there. I'm going to say, I'm going to say, Richard Spencer? And, and here's why, here's why. We're talking about an era of increasing polarization where, in fact, both sides are going more and more into their corners. We've just talked about demographics that are not on uh, the Republican Party side when it comes to women, when it comes to non-white dudes in rural areas. And it seems to me that uh, Donald Trump has shown no interest in doing the kind of moves that you're talking about, and you know, and that would make political sense according to politics as we used to think it was played. Uh, as Republic politics as being played right now by President Trump and those who seek to emulate him. The uh, Republican it Party, going the the Republican other Party had a Nick, well, Nikki Haley didn't run, but you have Nikki Haley, Marco Rubio, Bobby Jindal, uh, Tim Scott, Ted Cruz, and they picked. The 70 year old thrice married casino magnate. Exactly. That's what the party picked. Yep. Yep. Okay, so I want to get everybody here on the record, although you're free not to answer. We are five weeks out from the midterm elections, which are uh, going to determine many things, one of which is, you know, what are the last two years of Donald Trump's uh, term in office going to look like? Uh, so, Conventional wisdom in Washington has migrated more in the direction of Democrats taking back the House. As we all know, conventional wisdom uh, is inevitably wrong. The question is when. Uh, <laughs> uh, at what point is it inoperative? Uh, but I'm curious, do you all agree with that? 
Do you think Republicans still have a strong chance to keep control of the House of Representatives? Yeah, the, the one thing that gives them the chance is that I think the districts are very gerrymandered. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I'm betting, I bet on Democrats, but if I woke up and Republicans, you know, narrowly had the House, I would not be terribly surprised. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I would I say there's a few issues that I don't think are captured by the polling because they get down to cultural things. And, you know, speaking that you know, I don't live inside the Beltway, I live in West Virginia, and I see the issues that my fellow Republican-minded women friends are talking about that really strike them in a way that the Republican Party refuses to address. Um, one is Me Too, um, Black Lives Matter, school shootings, and family detention. There is no language I've seen among Republican leadership that knows how to message those concerns that are real and cut completely towards the Democrats. And because I've seen no way of addressing those things that I see my female friends cry about, um, I, I think there's potential for a huge tsunami. Mm -hmm. I think Democrats will take the House pretty easily, and I think they'll do it in a way that eradicates effectively uh, the portions of the Republican Party that have been resistant to Donald Trump within mm -hmm. the House. Right, so that you'll end up with a more um, Exactly, yeah, I mean, Ron, Ron Brownstein has this formulation that the, yeah. after this election, the gulf between the parties, yeah. the trench between the parties will be both deeper and wider. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I think that's correct, just as a sort of sociological, almost geographical matter. I think, for whatever it's worth, I've seen a fair amount of poll polls randomly this week, some private polling on both sides. It does seem to be expanding. These waves typically, once they get going, increase at the end, don't decrease. They're expanding the map, the Democrats in the House, and I, I personally think it's likely to be at the higher end of the estimates than the lower end. I think the Senate is much more in play than conventional wisdom has it. It's very unclear to me that any of these Democratic incumbents, with the probable exception of Heitkamp in North Dakota, uh, is going to lose. I think the Democratic incumbents could well hold on, and if they do, and then they win Nevada and maybe Arizona, uh, then obviously you have to pick up Tennessee or Texas, and I leave it to you guys in Texas to <laughs> tell me whether that's possible. But. Um, very, very balanced crowd here. Yeah. The, uh, you're very, Amanda's very offended. She worked for Senator Cruz. So. Um, the, <laughs> she you got, she's you not very offended, agree though. agree with Bill as far as the Senate being in so, play? So I, I it's all in play. I, I, I think it's all in play, but I, I, I actually want to ask you a question, Bill, which is why do you think you agree with that phenomenon of this is going to create a more Trumpian Republican Party in the House? Yeah. Why do you think, to the degree that there is any lingering uh, power to Republicans who are opposed to Trump, that they didn't get their act together to support a number of these candidates who are retiring or who've lost primaries, people like Mark Sanford in South Carolina, to more Trumpian candidates. Why didn't they band together in some fashion, either in a donor-backed effort or something else, to keep some of these people in Washington given that that would seem to be the logical way to try to keep some beachhead within the Republican Party. Yeah, I mean, they could have done more. I mean, not that many have lost primaries, but mostly they're going to lose general elections in tough seats. And so I live in Barbara Comstock's district. She's got plenty of resources, the moderate Republicans, the, the non-Trump Republicans, as well as some just normal sort of party loyalists and some Trump Republicans are all out for her. It's just you get a wave. You can throw all the money you want into this district or into other swing districts. And it gets tough. I would just say, I, th so I think you're probably right about what, how Congress will look. You're almost certainly right. But, you know, look, you can overstate it, too. There's a poll out of New Hampshire this morning, and this is consistent with other stuff I've seen. Uh, about two-thirds of New Hampshire Republicans right now think that Donald Trump should be renominated. About a third would at least want to consider another option. If you add independents who can vote in the New Hampshire primary, it gets closer to a sort of 60-40 split. Uh, the Trump, look, but the primary electorate is mostly going to be pro-Trump, no question. And if you have a one-on-one -on -one race between a Trump Republican and a non-Trump Republican, in, in most Republican districts, the Trump Republican's going to win. And that's happened in both the state level and the congressional level. Whether things will look exactly the same 18 months from now, you know, a lot can change, obviously, uh, including a possible Republican defeat this November, which might remind people that you can win primaries, but you can lose general elections. And if you were actually care about governing the country as opposed to sort of expressing resentments and anxieties, maybe you need to curb your uh, expression of resentments and anxieties and think about who could actually win. So, but we'll see. I mean, I, I, I'm not overconfident that, I, that we can liberate the Republican Party from Trump. I personally think it's we're very much worth trying because I think a future with the Trumpy Republican Party, I mean, you can laugh, but I just earnestly am going to say this. As a matter of actual governance of the United States of America, a Trumpy Republican Party is a disaster for the country. A nativist, authoritarian, 
uh, increasingly, you know, le representing anxieties and complaints, some of them legitimate, obviously, of less well-educated, working class and rural voters, but without having any policies to seriously address those things, is gonna mean that one of the two major parties is not serious about governing, can't work with the other. The Democrats, I don't have great confidence in either, honestly, so I'm very worried about the future of the country. So I feel like as a Republican, the best I can do is try to save the Republican Party. I leave it to the Democrats to try to find some responsible candidates. I would say, just one final point on that, the, 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 the conservative narrative that the Democrats are inevitably going off the deep end is not so obviously true to me. In a lot of House districts, at least, in some of the Senate primaries, the Democrats have nominated more moderate candidates. They're not actually going in the Republican direction. In Virginia 10, where I live, we nominated a fairly traditional uh, state rep. A lot of women candidates are winning, but a lot of these women have served in the CIA and the military and are not that left wing. Now, there are other cases where the progressives have won primaries. So the fight for the future of the, both parties, I think, will be very interesting over the next two years. It, it's, I'm sorry, but to, it's a really bold move to say that literally in the same building as that spray tan lawyer. I mean, <laughs> come on. Uh, the, the, the fact is that, that the fact that, that someone like Michael Avenatti can do what he does, which is lie to as many people as he does when he goes on cable news every day, is just disgusting to me. It's the Trump yeah. effect, though. Yeah. It's it is, the Donald it is. Trump effect. In fact, if this, if this was WWE, it would all turn out at the end that Michael Avenatti was working for Trump all along. <laughs> He's the perfect, right. the perfect foil in so many different ways. Well, look, it's, it's also kind of convenient to talk about him, you know, right? Is he really a Democrat? Does he actually... Is, I mean, who knows, right? Is that, you're talking about Trump or Avenatti? I'm, not sure <laughs> one, right? I'm curious as to his policies exactly. on intervention. Exactly. I, you know, I haven't had a chance to do my sit down on foreign policy with him yet, but, you know, I'll let you guys all know uh, when. Please. When but there is a level, he's filling a vacuum within the Democratic Party. I mean, look at what's going on there. It's amazing to me, given all the just material, anti Trump material in the air, that there's not a single Democrat that will do the Sunday shows and rise to a leadership level. Um, you sort of have Kamala Harris doing press conferences. They're all running scared. They're all completely scared of Trump. You're gonna have so many people running and no one wants to stick their neck out, which is incredible to me because this, is, this should be easy. It should be a layup for them and somehow they're still fumbling. But if, if Beto wins, as Bill Crystal right. said yesterday on the podcast, if Beto wins, he's the nominee. Really? Who's better? I would go, if well, I put it this way. There's going to be 20 people that fight it out, and it's going to be a replay of the Republican primary. I'm not in the business of devising, of devising yeah. Democrats, but if I were a Democrat yeah. and Beto were to win in Texas, I would immediately sign up for him for president. I think he's, he's, he's a Barack Obama then. Is, right, what, is it him or Evan? Who, who's better? I don't, yeah, I mean, well, I, can, I could throw yeah. some people out there, but yeah. Okay, so this actually gets at my next question, which is very much related to this. So we're obviously only a few weeks out from the 2018 midterms. Both uh, Barack Obama uh, and uh, George W. Bush showed that uh, reverses in a first-term, midterm election actually proved helpful mm -hmm. to them. Uh, arguably, uh, Bill Clinton had the same experience in terms of actually then regrouping, rebooting their presidency, and using that setback to help them win re-election to a second term. Uh, is there a scenario where Republicans win by losing here? Well, part of the problem is that Bill Clinton learned the lesson from losing. <laughs> Does anybody think that Donald Trump says, we, we, gotta, we gotta get things straightened out now. Oh, they're no just way. gonna spend money. Yeah. That's all it means. Democrats win, they're just gonna spend lots of money with the side of impeachment hearings in the House. I, I completely agree. They, they're, they're just, <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, no, I mean, it's... So it, you, don't the, think, you don't think don't, there's a potential uh, scenario here I, where there's, Trump there's obvi wins it's infrastructure there's absolutely weekend. a political short-term benefit for him of having a foil as opposed to having control yeah. uh, because it's an illusion of control. Mm -hmm. and, right. uh, and so in reality, as long as he is able to hold the Senate, uh, uh, I think that he's basically going to have roughly the same two-year period that he would have anyway because... Frankly, our representative branch of government is completely dysfunctional and does not work. So the, uh, the you know, the, we have a reality right now where the American people in both parties have taken the lesson from the last 15 plus years of failure to advance agendas under both George W. Bush and Barack Obama, that the only things that really matter are the courts 
which adjudicate and then resolve our cultural disputes because apparently yeah. Americans no longer have the ability to do that for themselves. And, uh, and the administration side of things that sets the rules and turns the knobs and pulls the levers that affect the economy. And that's it. And because of that, they really no longer expect anything out of uh, the representative side of Washington other than investigations and potential impeachments and the kind of circus that they've had going on now for years. I'm getting this I, just as a gloomy I, I just, panel. <laughs> I think, are we no, I, mean, I sort of agree with uh, almost everything about that. I just say this, I mean, Trump is a shrewd politician in his own way. I, I'm not so certain that he couldn't make some adjustments. Uh, and also, so much depends on what happens. I mean, there's, there's one big fork in the road, obviously, which is the Mueller report. I mean, a report that provides, let's just say, plausible grounds for considering impeachment uh, would lead to impeachment hearings and leads you into one scenario where I do think you get pretty much just a kind of bloodbath between the two parties, a rallying to Trump by the Republican members, presumably, unless this is some real smoking gun in there, and impeachment proceedings by the Democrats, which took partisan, and it could end up helping Trump, obviously, as with Clinton. If the Mueller report is, falls short of that, then you could recalibrate. I do think you could see both, I mean, the Democrats will be in an interesting position. Do their voters want them to work with Trump on actual legislation? But things can happen. I mean, if there's like, starts to be a recession, there'll be a real push for, one reason people can get away with the partisanship now is people don't feel a great urgency about some of the problems. Obamacare is not great, but it's sort of stable, I guess. The economy's been pretty good. Foreign policy, we've averted what I would regard as real dangers coming perhaps from both Obama's and Trump's foreign policy, but in any case, they're not evident quite yet. You get real crises, things could change. So I do think it's an extremely fluid and unpredictable moment. One thing, and this would be totally contrary and probably wishful is, I mean, shouldn't some backbench members of both parties and both bodies actually look up at some point and say, did I really come here just to be either a rubber stamp for leadership or an ineffectual protester occasionally against leadership? Could I actually not get with some member from another party and actually advance legislation on topic A, B, or C, and we could actually <laughs> pressure the leadership to do something? I mean, that has been totally, people try their tiny baby steps and then it kind of goes nowhere usually. But I, I guess if you got it, it so much depends on the mood and, and um, whether Trump's hold on the party is stronger or weaker. I do think an election result, leave aside impeachment for a minute, if he loses, a lot of the Trump, lo the loyalty to Trump comes from the sense that he found the magic, you know, potion. I mean, McC uh, McCain lost, Romney lost, Trump won, and no one thought he could win. And that gives you a lot of power in a democracy, you know, understandably, right? You're the guy who won mm -hmm. the presidency when no one thought you could. I, I don't think losing in 2018 takes that away in, in, in whole by any means because he still won the presidency and you usually lose seats in an off-term election, off-year election. But it will, it will take some of the edge off that kind of command that Trump now has over these Republican congressmen and senators. All right, so I want to bring everybody else in on this question of, you know, Trump's power and what it derives from and whether you perceive him to be strong enough to fend off uh, a, a challenger in 2020 from inside the Republican Party, uh, first of all, uh, is there anyone who will, in a serious way, take him on? And second of all, do any of you think there's a realistic scenario for a second term at this point? There's, yeah. there's yeah. absolutely a realistic scenario for a second term, and, and I think he will curb stomp anyone who tries to run against him in the Republican primary. I mean, it's just that we can't pretend like things are the way they used to be because they aren't, and it doesn't do us any good to it's fun to play pretend, but it's, it doesn't do us any good when it comes to analysis. And I just think that, you know, when it comes to the, the type of thing that Bill is optimistically saying about people working together across sides, what if re re representative politics does represent? And what if what the people actually want is the rubber stamp? What if what they want from most of their, you know, representative people is the guy who's just going to be a vote? Do you think that anybody who cares about Kavanaugh in the past couple of weeks knew who he was. They might know that George W. Bush is making calls for him in the Senate. They might know that he's got that stamp of endorsement. They have no idea who he is. He's a vote. That's what he is. He's a vote for my side. And that's just the way that American politics works now. And I don't think that there's going to be any kind of change in that regard. When it comes to 2020, it's all about who the Democrats nominate. Mm -hmm. And the Look, I mean, I have my own biases here. I think that you, I think that Joe Biden could easily beat Donald Trump. But Joe Biden, who is a very fundamentally decent man, uh, is not what the Democratic Party wants right yeah, now. Yeah. 
Actually, they, want, they want someone who's going to take the bark off of Trump in a way right. that Joe Biden is, is not interested in because he, Joe, Joe will say something like, as much as he's critical of Trump, he will say his voters had a point or we didn't give them enough of an agenda to solve some of the defects of globalism. And we, you know, th we didn't give uh, enough to reach out to them. He wants those union households back. That's not the trajectory of the Democratic Party right now. And so instead, if they end up just looking at that field of 17 people and picking the person who is the most critical of Donald Trump, it's gonna feel good, mm -hmm. but it's also not in terms of a savvy way to, to it's, win it's, the it's country It's a self it's like a, a vicious cycle here. But I, and uh, Amanda alluded to this early on, but I think it bears repeating, even though it won't be popular to say here, which is, you know, let me say, like, my dad was a prison guard in Hagerstown, Maryland for 30 years. I went to college in West Virginia. Um, you know, my mom didn't just vote for Trump, she drove people to the polls to vote for Trump. So I kind of, like literally, I kind of, I didn't, I didn't vote for Trump, but I, but I get it. And we have this tribalism that's happening. And if you're out there and you're, you're not a conservative, just put yourself in the shoes of, of conservatives for a second. I mean, you believe that there's a world where no matter who we nominate at, for the Supreme Court at the last minute, there will be an accusation of something horrible and scurrilous. We believe that you can't even go to a restaurant in Washington, D.C. with your wife and have dinner without a mob showing up and running you out of, out of the restaurant. We believe that you could, you could be a devout Christian and own a business and the government will force you to bake a cake whether you want to or not. Conservatives out there, and I'm talking about not people who live in Alexandria, Virginia like I do, but the folks out there like where my mom lives in Pennsylvania, they feel like they are under attack, right? And it's not just we don't like the Hispanics. That's not it. It's literally we're being chased out of restaurants because we disagree on politics. And that really helps explain why they toe the line and support Donald Trump because he fights. Because Trump is the one guy who will fight and won't back down. And I think Brett Kavanaugh was very strategic yesterday. And I don't want to weigh into whether he's innocent or not. I don't know. But when he came out and decided to fight and really go on the, on the offense. I think he, he wasn't just tapping into the Trumpism. I think he was telling Donald Trump, mm -hmm. don't drop me, because yeah. I'm your guy. I'm just like you. I think it's going to, well, it certainly worked for now. Yeah. So Amanda, I'll give this to you, and then get ready for your questions, because I want to bring the audience in. Yeah, I'll just kind of back clean up here. I think there's three fantasies uh, about Trump that exist right now, because I keep hearing it from people. The first one is that someone will primary him in the uh, presidential election. That is not going to happen. Um, I work for Senator Jim DeMint. I work for Ted Cruz. I know what it takes to be an outsider that challenges the system, the grassroots support that you need, the money you need to raise. Um, that is not happening right now. The second sort of fantasy out there is that for some reason Donald Trump will give it up. He won't run for re-election. Um, the Mueller investigation will shove him out of the process. Uh, that is not going to happen. Have you ever seen a person that is so attracted to fame and power and control? There's no way he's giving that up willingly. Um, the third fantasy is that the midterms will represent some kind of reset and recalibration. Absolutely not. The day after the midterms, the general election begins, and Donald Trump starts as the presumptive Republican nominee, and then he has 17 or more Democratic opponents to isolate and <coughs> campaign against. If you think it's ugly now, it will be much uglier beginning the second week of November. I just want to say for the record, there will be a primary challenge to Donald Trump, I believe. It probably won't succeed, but I think it has an outside chance. No one thought in October of 66 that Lyndon Johnson wouldn't be renominated in 68. Uh, and if you're young, you remember three eight-year presidencies, each of which were characterized by the incumbent not having a primary challenge, which is one reason why Bush, Obama, and uh, uh, Clinton before Bush all actually won re-election, but I am older and I remember 68 and I remember 76 when Reagan almost beat Ford and I remember 80 when Kennedy almost beat Carter. I think it's less than possible. There's a lot of money out there. There's some money that will come in to help a challenger to Trump. It's more likely a Buchanan 92 situation, uh, leaving aside the, uh, where Buchanan was from politically, but in the sense of it's a kind of gesture. Buchanan wounded Bush incidentally though in 92 in New Hampshire. Uh, and I do think things can change a lot. So let's see where we are a year from now. We've all been surprised so much that we shouldn't assume that the current snapshot 
of Trump, which isn't as strong as people say, but is reasonably strong within the Republican Party, certainly, is you know, there forever, depending on sort of impervious to real world events and to other developments, I think. Well, Bill, thank you so much for that point, because that was the, what I was getting at in the primary, not so much that somebody would defeat him in a primary, but that uh, certainly history suggests a credible primary challenge uh, is the way that, to the extent we've had modern presidents who lost for a second term, that was the way. Um, questions? On the road trip, oh, sorry. Uh, I'm the multimedia reporter for the Tribune, thank you. Um, we have gotten some questions. A Twitter user asks, in your view, do the numerous inconsistencies in Kavanaugh's testimony from high school antics to work in the Bush W.H. White House um, remove his credibility defending himself against rape? And I'll just remind the audience and those watching the live stream, if you have questions, we're not doing live audience, just tweet your questions uh, using the hashtag AskTrib. Would you like me to repeat or? No. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> no one wants to take yeah, the uh, Kavanaugh I mean, it's, question. It's been hard to look at all those because all the focus has been on the accusations. Um, as I sort of said at the beginning of this panel, I always question why he exactly was the pick because I don't think that he fits the right moment in time, um, judging from his history working you know, with Monica Lewinsky, working the Bush administration and just not bringing the kind of outsider view to the court that I was hopeful uh, Donald Trump would try to put on that court. I was looking for somebody with a less traditional background. Um, but I mean, of all the questions, that certainly won't be the one that trips him up. It was an untrumpian pick in a lot of ways. He's very safe from the perspective mm -hmm. of Washington. Perfect resume, sterling credentials, loved by the Bush administration, and was obviously a Kennedy clerk. So just the, the idea was we pick someone super safe for this position, and then the next time that he gets one, if there is a next time, if it's replacing someone like Ruth Bader Ginsburg, then you go for one of the female candidates. And uh, I think that was the rationale internally, but it was actually an untrumpian choice in a lot of ways, one that people complimented when it was actually made within the DC legal scene, because to them, Kavanaugh is, is sort of- Although a, McConnell a, did question his long paper trail. Yes, which he did obviously was, yeah. it was a factor. Thank you. Um, Mike Iowang, pardon me if I mispronounce, asks, how does the Republican Party appeal to young people given the current demographic splits? Uh, you got any other questions? That's, uh, <laughs> they, they don't. They don't is the answer. <laughs> Pass. <laughs> An attendee uh, texts us, what do you well, have to say about the attack Democrats feel that they believe that their rights and beliefs are being openly attacked with the repeal of Obamacare, with the fear of harassment and the toleration of hate speech as free speech. Can I, I'm sorry, let me, let me backtrack. I'll take back what I said. If there was a way to appeal to young people, and it's very difficult, believe me, uh, very difficult right now, I think the way, for me, the way to do it is the, talk, talking about opportunities. Like Uber, I know Uber has a, a, an interesting history here in Austin, but. But when you talk about the, idea, the ability of somebody to be entrepreneurial and to create something, whether it's an app or whatever, and not to have uh, onerous bureaucracy or regulation stop them from doing that, in my mind, that used to be at least a conservative and a Republican value. And that is something, I think there are a lot of young people who are, they, they might think they're democratic socialists, but they're actually very entrepreneurial in that tech way, and they just don't know it yet. That would be my, my answer to that one. Uh, Mark Terry asks, as a conservative moderate Republican, is there no hope for centrism in either party? Are we doomed? Yeah. Oh, Ben is definitely taking the doomed question. Are we here. doomed? <laughs> well, well uh, yes, in the long term, we're all doomed. <laughs> uh, long enough timeline. Uh, so the, I think that we overestimate where we lack a proper definition of centrism. Yeah. Um, the fact of the matter is that for a long time, we had a false vision of bipartisanship and centrism because of the persistence of Dixiecrats, because of Southern Democrats who could cross the line to vote in favor of military spending or uh, you know, in favor of uh, small C conservative sort of social policies, things of that nature, pro-gun. Um, as they sorted out, they went away or they became Republicans. I remember Virgil Goode when he was a Blue Dog Democrat and then when he, and one in Virginia and then one in Virginia as an independent and then one in Virginia as a Republican. 
And that's what happened. So the, the idea of centrism and bipartisanship, I think, is, uh, is gone when it comes to trying to achieve the more, uh, uh, the more ambitious aspects of an agenda, but it is still persistent and I think is only likely to become more so uh, in the one area that is, uh, in one area that is Amanda's bugaboo, which is spending. Okay, there's, all, there's a massive and successful bipartisan agenda when it comes to spending. Mm -hmm. Spending your money is something that they can always find a way to come to an agreement on. Uh, and so that aspect of centrism uh, endures uh, for our Sadly. citizens. I mean, I would just, this gets maybe to the last two or three questions, and this is prompted by some of the interesting comments people have made. I think one way to put the question, and I really think this is a question, is, is the country radically divided? Is the country hyperpartisan? And there is some evidence that there's a lot of socioeconomic sorting in the different counties and rural, urban, and et cetera, the coasts and the, and the center. Um, or is our politics broken? Is Congress hyperpartisan? Do we happen to have Donald Trump as president followed, following Barack Obama, who was you know, reasonably partisan, I would say, uh, or whether he chose to be or not, ended up being a reasonably partisan uh, Democratic president, and whether he intended to be or not. Um, so maybe sort of Washington is broken, but I don't know, you go around America, do you really feel like people are just at knives, you know, knives at each other's throats? I'm not so sure about that. If you look at city government and a lot of state governments, I think Texas might be an exception here, um, you don't see rabid partisanship. You see a fair amount of traditional looking politics in a lot of very big states. You see states where there are state legislatures that are split and so forth. There'll be more of those after this election, I think. Um, so I'm a little, and so even sociologically, people understand that there are gun owners and people who believe in gun control. There are uh, faith, you know, people who go to church every Sunday and people who are very secular and so forth. But a lot of them live near each other in a lot of areas of the country and don't, you know, are not in a virtual civil war. So I'm, I myself, sometimes you read these sociological studies and you think, whoa, the country itself is really divided. And at other times you think we have for various reasons, some of them structural, some of them accidental, come up with a politics that's extremely nasty and divided, but underneath it, you have a country that isn't, doesn't really feel that way. And I, I really don't, that's an, it's, it's an important question, I think, to think about, and to think about then how to mitigate the, the divisiveness to the extent it's there. I could not disagree with you more. I think we really are divided in that <laughs> level of, and you use the phrase virtual civil war, which I think is very fitting, given the fact that we have that war playing out on social media every single day. The, the, uh, there was a phenomenon that has happened in the past couple of weeks, and this was even before the allegations came out about Brett Kavanaugh, um, where we started to get people uh, who basically said, I've, I've had a death threat from one of my neighbors over this, over my position on Kavanaugh. And we started getting these things in and people having to report these various death threats being made to them on social media. As someone who's in media, I'm sure you're used to getting death threats. We get them fairly consistently. Um, my wife is on TV. I'm not exaggerating, we do. Um, um, and that leads to a lot of phone calls with the FBI that are not exactly pleasant. But the, the fact that this has now gone down to this level where just having an opinion and putting it out there in public makes someone who you know or might see react to, the, to you that way, well, you it's seen, just you, ridiculous. The, 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 I want to make the war, opposite point. The Civil War was brother that. against brother. Have you seen all the, I, I think Ben is right, I've seen multiple examples in the past couple of weeks where Family. political candidates have brothers running yeah, TV ads Arizona against race. them. Uh, I kind of like that ad, but I mean, the ghosts are ahead, but, <laughs> but no, it's, there's exactly more the point, than one. It? It's, it's more kind of one. different to run an ad against your brother who you disapprove of, who's running for Congress and say he should be defeated <laughs> for Congress, him, yeah. than a civil war. I have three kids, they're all each married, so six, you know, six kids and, and uh, sons and daughters in law in their 30s. I meet them and a lot of their friends. I do not think they are living in a virtual civil war. They have friends who are liberals or conservatives. They have friends of all ethnicities and races. They have gay friends and straight friends. I don't want to sound like some you know, feel-good ad, but it's not the case that those people are waking up every morning loathing the person in the apartment next door or in the house next door because they know that the other person differs with them on Kavanaugh or on Trump. So but I think I'm, what I'm very tells suspicious. us what? is that Trump is so in your face, he forces everyone to have an opinion to about some everything. Look, Trump no, makes really, it worse. You can't Trump makes be it worse. the road on anything because everything yeah. is a topic Bill. for discussion. And I think it's, I want to live in Bill Crystal's America. America. have so much control in our lives. <laughs> um, but we're being forced to take positions on almost every aspect 
of civil life. But you and should have been around. You should be old. You shouldn't be, but you, <laughs> if you were as old as I were, you would remember, you know, 1968 and even 1974. I, I am, and even the Reagan years, I am not convinced that in the real world, on race relations, on even on gender, which is, I mean, I was talking with some of my conservative friends, I guess I tweeted this, that, you know, it's like in the good old days, things were much calmer, and now gender relations are fraught. Yeah, but if you're a conservative, and I am one, and you read Kavanaugh's 1983 yearbook, leaving aside whether it's a real issue in this confirmation, it's a little creepy. I mean, I do not want to go back to that world of boys talking that way. And in that respect, I think we have a healthier society in many ways than in the wonderful good old days when everyone allegedly got along. And well, I would certainly, the same, well, I I would certainly you, say the same for race You can't say that social race media hasn't changed sex. everything and the comment that somebody left you know, on your page that forces your neighbor to ask you about that. I mean, that is a whole new dimension that well, I, forces I, people to take sides yep. on every issue. There's no hiding out. Don't you That's feel, Bill, don't you feel a little bit, and I agree with you, that there was a lot of stuff in the good old days that wasn't so good, you know what I mean? I agree with that, but don't you also feel like we're walking around on pins and needles yep. a little bit? Like, like one slip up and someone's going to take you down. Yeah, to some degree, and I think that's unfortunate. I think that's particularly, and I think social media is an important phenomenon that it probably, on the whole, exacerbates this problem and a kind of gotcha culture, certainly for people in public life, whether it's media or obviously elective office. That's still not most people, but I don't know. I mean, I look, I, I pose it as a question. There are aspects of our culture and our society that are genuinely divided and divisive. The other aspects, I think, where Washington or, or Twitter or social media or our lives, honestly, don't reflect an underlying reality, which I think is... is it, it is it is certainly possible that this is just, this is 68 over again, mm -hmm. okay? But I would just suggest that this is 68 faster because of social media, because of, and more in the open. And, and let me suggest one cause of this. We've seen, you know, Emily Eakins, who's a head of polling for uh, the Cato Institute, had a, uh, a great op-ed in the New York Times uh, two weeks ago where she talked about um, how uh, different aspects of Trump voters, who she has done a lot of work at analyzing uh, poll-wise, when it comes to church attendance. And essentially she found that if you attend church regularly, your attitudes on immigration are far more moderate, your attitudes towards refugees are far more welcoming, and there's a whole host of other attributes as well that go with it that essentially reflect someone who is a more active member of their community. The degradation of faith as being at the center of American life has had a significant ramification for our discourse. There is nothing that will stop you treating someone in an inhuman way, like recognizing that even if we have different parties and different beliefs, that we are in the same pew on the day of worship. And if you look at that person in that light, then you view them as, their fellow, as your fellow believer, as uh, it makes you think of them in the context of the divine and not just the crassly human. Being and accountable to someone else. And, and yes, and, and I think that that, the, the, as that has retreated from our public life, particularly for working class Americans, I think that it has forced us into this toxic and constant maelstrom. I think he's right. Go to church. What he said. <laughs> we have two minutes. Uh, many are asking, what's next for Kavanaugh? A vote. <laughs> okay, we can go to one more. Um, more Republicans than ever uh, believe distrusted or have distrusted the news media. How can this be changed? The, the, media needs, the media needs to do a better job. I'm serious. No, I'm serious. There was a, the front page, I think it was the front page, the New York Times a couple weeks ago had a big story that Nikki Haley had spent $50 million or something <laughs> to put in curtains in the uh, ambassador's mansion, and it was totally bogus. Look. I I'm, I, I I'm work sorry, at, I work at the- It actually wasn't totally bogus. Just, please. just as a point of clarification. So there was a mistake in the story and how it was characterized, but actually it was the State Department in the last year that approved the expenditure of the $52,000 drapes at the same time that they were proposing cutting the State Department's budget by 30%. They were recommended by an interior decorator on contract to the State Department in the end of 2016, the end of the Obama administration. But in fact, 
it was approved by them. They shouldn't have run a picture of Nikki Haley. As far as we know, no one's ever line. established it. But just I feel like you're clear. stepping on my point here a little bit, but I okay. Am. Maybe, I am. Maybe, I am. maybe it was, maybe it was fake matter. news for me. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm joking. They, added, they said that they should not have done matter. it that way. And if you screw up in journalism, you run a correction, you run a clarification, you don't go to war against the free press. I'm sorry. No, no, I, I would, thank you. And thanks for correcting me. So I, I agree with all that. I write for the Daily Beast, I go on CNN. I believe, actually, I believe that the institution of the media is incredibly important to hold powerful people accountable. And I believe that when, when we mess up, as I just did, <laughs> when, when we mess we up, all do. We all when do. we mess up, what we're doing is actually reinforcing a stereotype that a lot of the people I was talking about earlier who live where my mom lives in Pennsylvania, they are predisposed to believe that the media is liberally biased and the media is out to get them. And so I guess what I'm doing is calling on us to up our game because otherwise we actually reinforce Donald Trump's fake media narrative. The only thing, just one quick point, you combine the prime time numbers for every major cable news network and you still do not get the premier number for Rick and Morty, okay? So no offense to the people who work in those industries, obviously. You we're know, all in it. And we're all in it. But the point is, I think we, we have, the media has no higher opinion of anything than of itself a lot of the time, <laughs> of its importance and centrality to American life. Most Americans are not watching, okay? Most of them are looking at other things uh, culturally, and I don't think that that's necessarily a bad thing all the time, but I do think that we all can be better and be more diligent recognizing that that mistake now can, can go, just speaking of speed, it can go so fast in terms of getting out there, and so it makes it all the more important to get it right. The truth is halfway across the world <laughs> really? before, a, no, a lie is halfway across, across the world before the truth is put on his shoes. His pants on, something like yeah. that. Boots. Mark Twain. It wears Boots. pants. Pants. Does the truth wear pants? I don't know. It doesn't like, wear pants. I won't even make a joke. I'm, I don't think you should make comments about pants after the week we've had. Thank you all, yeah. all the time for questions we have. What a great job, guys. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to.